you sign to a contract, you're going to take a minority share of the winnings. A select few of us will do well. The majority will not. Prince, the artist, the legend, the guy who wouldn't just sit down and play by the industry's shady rules. This is a story of power plays, betrayal, and, of course, a bit of rock star drama involving Jay-Z, Diddy, and some suspicious corporate overlords. And if you think Prince was just another eccentric artist, well, think again, because what he knew and what he fought against might blow your mind. Could the very system Prince was fighting against have played a role in his untimely death? So, I met Prince when I was 12. Where, where did you meet Prince when you were 12? At, in Dayton. Um, after really? he performed at UD Arena. Yeah, and I knew him my whole life. He was like the guiding force for me. It's the reason that I, I, I had high self-esteem was because of him. Like, just a lot of things that I did Did he say something or was his behavior inspiring and, and self-esteem shedding? <laughs> no, no, he wasn't. He wasn't really like that. A 12-year-old Cat Williams, all wide-eyed, meets Prince after a show in Dayton. That was the beginning of a lifetime of inspiration from a guy who was always, and I mean always, 10 steps ahead of everyone else. Prince wasn't just some musician. He was a force, a rebel, a guy who played 26 instruments just because he could. He stood for real artistry something that the corporate puppeteers of the music industry couldn't quite wrap their heads around. They wanted control, and Prince, well, he wanted freedom. He was just an amazing individual. I, I was able to meet him when I was 12, and I knew him um, my entire life through all of his changes. I was able to um, assist him many times. Now, Prince wasn't stupid. He saw what was happening. You've got these corporations like Warner Brothers that signed artists and then turned around and treated them like products on a shelf. They owned everything Prince produced and that just didn't sit right with him. Remember the whole name change thing? That wasn't just a gimmick. The guy literally changed his name to a symbol to free himself from Warner's clutches. Because if they owned Prince, He'd be damned if he let them own the new version of himself, too. And here's where Jay-Z and Diddy come into play. Or should I say, here's where they tried to play Prince. Jay-Z, with his streaming service title, wanted Prince's entire music catalog. And you know what Prince said? Absolutely not. He wasn't about to let another rich guy turn his life's work into just another bullet point on a corporate profit sheet. Jay-Z tried to smooth talk his way in, but Prince wasn't buying it. He wasn't letting anyone take advantage of him again, not after Warner. In the last interview we did, you were speaking about how Puffy, he told on Suge Knight, Irv Gotti, and Jay Prince about the distribution company they was trying to make. How do you know for a fact that Puffy told the police? So if you don't mind, can you break that down some more, yo, for the people? Because it wasn't the police, it was the feds, one of the persons who was with them. But Jay-Z wasn't the only one cozying up to the wrong people. Diddy was tight with Warner, while Prince was out here trying to escape their grasp. And then, brace yourself, Diddy had the audacity to get all sentimental when Prince died, talking about how Prince inspired him and how heartbroken he was. Prince was fighting the system Diddy was thriving in. That's some pretty convenient heartbreak if you ask me. And let's not forget the freak off parties. Apparently, Diddy had these infamous parties that were less about music and more about, uh, uh, well, let's just say Prince wanted no part of it. Prince had his own parties, the 3,121 gatherings, where artists could be artists without all the shady nonsense. It was a place where people could actually connect without the corporate vultures looming overhead. So as a people, we'll be considered a minority. But stop, let's take a moment and look at yourself. There's nothing minor about you. You are a blessed people. You're the most talented on earth and you are still grateful. 
That is why upon winning in their game, you always thank God. Tonight I would like to ask one favor of you. Imagine what we'll all be like in our own game. Peace and love for one another. But of course, when you try to be different, when you challenge the people in power, you become a problem. Prince had been calling out the industry for years. He wasn't shy about pointing out how artists were getting exploited left and right, how they were signing away their lives for a contract that promised them nothing but empty fame. He literally wrote slave on his face to make sure no one misunderstood. He felt like a slave to these corporations and when he started gaining traction, started getting his independence back, suddenly he's gone an accidental overdose, they called it. But fans aren't buying it, and neither are some people in the industry. They found an unresponsive male in the elevator. CPR was initially started, but was unsuccessful. He was pronounced deceased at 10.07. Right after Prince regained control of his masters, something he fought decades for, he ends up dead in an elevator in his own home. The timing's more than a little suspicious. Prince. Prince, huge fan, sir. Prince, love it, brother. And you know what's even more twisted? After Prince died, Jay-Z tried to claim that Tidal had rights to Prince's entire back catalogue. He even bragged about it in a song, saying, Prince's masters were safe and sound. Really, Jay, because from where I'm sitting, it looks more like you were trying to make a quick buck off a man who explicitly said he wanted nothing to do with you. A lot of people don't know that you were his business partner. You were the last person he wanted to, uh, to, to do business with. After he beat the music industry, he wanted to be with you. Tell us about the significance of that relationship between Prince Rogers Nelson and Sean Jay-Z Carter for you. Really deep for me. There's a lot of talk about how Prince was too influential, too powerful, and that's why he had to go. He showed other artists that they could take control of their own careers, that they didn't need these big labels to succeed. He was threatening the very foundation of the music industry, and they couldn't have that. Think about it, if Prince could do it, what was stopping other artists from following suit? It would have turned the whole industry on its head and the people in power couldn't let that happen. And for him to come, he came to me. I didn't, I, I didn't even have the nerve to call him and say, like, he came to me and said, I know what you're doing. I'm going to give you all of my work. Like a person who fought for their work their whole entire life to come to your office and say, I know what you're doing here. It was a really deep thing for me. Prince wasn't the first, and he sure as hell wasn't the last. Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Sam Cooke, all artists who spoke out, all artists who ended up dead under suspicious circumstances. There's a pattern here, and it's not a pretty one. When artists get too powerful, too independent, they suddenly become a problem that needs to be dealt with. As for Jay-Z and Diddy, they're still here, still making deals, still making money. Diddy's out here forming partnerships with Warner, the same company that Prince fought tooth and nail to get away from. And Jay-Z? He's cozying up to whoever will help him grow his empire. Artists be damned. Prince saw through all of it. He knew exactly who these people were, and he kept his distance for a reason. Now people are starting to wonder if Cat Williams is going to drop another bombshell. He's already hinted at knowing more than he's let on, and rumors are swirling that he's about to spill some serious tea about what really happened to Prince. It's no secret that Cat's been in hot water with the industry before, He's one of the few who's willing to speak out about the ugly side of fame, about the things that people in power would rather keep hidden. Prince wasn't just a musician, he was a visionary, a revolutionary, who fought for something bigger than himself. He wanted artists to have control, to have freedom, to not be at the mercy of corporate greed. And that scared a lot of people, because if there's one thing people in power hate, it's losing control. Prince's battle with Warner Brothers began back in 1977, when he was just 18 years old. He signed a contract with them, and they gave him something almost unheard of at the time, full artistic control. He could write, produce and play all the instruments on his albums. It seemed like a dream deal. But Warner wasn't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They knew Prince was a goldmine, and they wanted to cash in. 
They let him have creative freedom, sure, but they owned everything he created. And as Prince's fame grew through the 80s, with hits like Purple Rain and 1999, Warner's grip on him only tightened. You know, like Mariah Carey just had this big $20 million. It's like, that's like a huge deal, right? So you, you feeling that? <laughs> no, I, I, well, what I mean, I don't understand. What, uh, the public sees the word $20 million an album. Well, you, well you, let's see, do you, do you all think that's a good deal? What, uh, <laughs> but Prince started to see the cracks in the system. Warner wanted to control when and how his music was released, worried that too much new music would flood the market. They were holding back his art, not for any creative reason, but for pure business. This was a guy who could write, record, and produce music faster than most people could think. And here were these suits telling him to slow down, to wait, to hold back. It didn't sit right with him. By the early 90s, things were boiling over. Prince was still under contract to deliver albums, but Warner was making all the decisions about when they'd come out. They were trying to control his output, control his art. And Prince had had enough. In 1993, he made a bold move. He changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol. It was his way of breaking free, of saying, you don't own me. Under his birth name, Prince Rogers Nelson, Warner had him locked down. But as the artist formerly known as Prince, he could start fresh. He could make music without them pulling the strings. It was a middle finger to the industry, a refusal to be controlled. He even started performing with the word slave written on his face, making it crystal clear how he felt about his relationship with Warner. Eventually, his contract with Warner expired and Prince was finally able to regain some control over his career. He formed his own label, NPG Records, and began releasing music on his terms. He wanted to show other artists that there was another way, that they didn't have to sign their lives away to these corporate giants. But Warner still owned the masters to all the music he had created under their contract. They were still making millions off of his work, and there wasn't much he could do about it. The fight over his masters was far from over. Prince's battle with the industry wasn't just about his own music. It was about the future of all artists, and he wanted to make sure that the next generation didn't fall into the same traps. He was vocal about the fact that the music industry was built to exploit artists, that the contracts were designed to keep musicians in debt and under control. He called it modern-day slavery, and he wasn't wrong. The corporations owned everything, the music, the name, the image. Artists were just cogs in the machine, and Prince was determined to break free. He encouraged others to do the same, to fight for their rights, and to demand control over their own work. In the mid-2000s, Prince started to embrace the digital age. He saw the potential for artists to connect directly with their fans, to bypass the record labels entirely. He was one of the first major artists to release an album exclusively online, and he even sued websites like YouTube and eBay for using his music without permission. He was trying to carve out a new path, one where artists could actually benefit from their work instead of having it taken from them by middlemen. You haven't always loved the internet. Uh, how are you seeing progress right now with all of that? Can you use it to your advantage? Um. It's a double-edged sword, you know. A lot of artists aren't getting paid full scale for their art. And the internet, because of downloading and things like that, is kind of like a black hole. And it's hard to audit, it's hard to get accounting. And it's not that it's just about the money, but it's about justice and fairness. And when people say that they love you and they respect you, but at the same time take, you know, 80% of your earnings, then and then expect you to fix your own communities and they'll probably edit all of this out but <laughs> but the industry wasn't ready for that kind of change the people in power didn't want artists to have that kind of independence they needed control and prince was threatening to take that away from them he pulled his music from all streaming platforms except tidal thinking that jay-z's promise of an artist-friendly platform might be different but it didn't take long for him to realize that Jay-Z was just another player in the same game. When Prince refused to give up ownership of his music, 
things started to get messy. After Prince's death in 2016, his estate accused Tidal and Rock Nation of exploiting his music without permission. Jay-Z claimed that Prince had given him the rights, but the estate wasn't buying it. They filed a lawsuit, and the battle over Prince's legacy continued. It was exactly the kind of situation Prince had fought his whole life to avoid, his art being used without his consent and his wishes being ignored. And then there's the timing of it all. Just two years after Prince finally regained control of his masters, he was found dead in his home. The official story was that it was an accidental overdose, that he had taken counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl. But fans and friends alike couldn't help but question the narrative. Prince was always careful, always conscious of what he put into his body. The idea that he accidentally took a deadly dose just didn't add up for a lot of people. So many artists who spoke out, who tried to take control, ended up dead under mysterious circumstances. It's almost like there's an invisible line, and once you cross it, you become expendable. For decades, Prince waged war with the music industry. A war not just over money, but over control. He wanted ownership of his music. While corporations like Warner Brothers saw him as just another cash cow, Prince famously changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol and even wrote slave on his face during performances to rebel against these powers. He wasn't just fighting for himself either. Prince wanted to show other artists the path to independence and that scared the people at the top. But right after he managed to regain control of his masters, he was suddenly gone. A suspiciously neat conclusion to a decades-long battle. Cat Williams has repeatedly voiced his doubts about the official cause of death. Williams has been a thorn in the side of the entertainment industry for years, calling out the corruption and exploitation that happens behind closed doors. His claims about Prince's death have sparked renewed interest in the darker side of the music business. He believes that Prince was silenced because he was a threat to the status quo, a man who refused to bend to the will of corporate overlords. In one of Prince's final interviews, he allegedly said something chilling. Listen before they kill me. Not exactly the words of someone who thinks they're in a safe space. To fully understand why Williams and many others suspect foul play, you need to consider the timing of Prince's death. Prince had just won a monumental battle to gain control over his music catalog, something he had been fighting for since the 1990s. He wasn't about to let another corporation make money off his life's work. We've watched you evolve over the years, not only as a musician, but as a man. And uh, I wonder sometimes when you look back at old material, like I've looked at so much in the last 24 hours to prepare for this. Do you look back at old stuff, risque stuff, and, and want to separate yourself from it? Well, you know, when you're 20 years old, you're looking for the ledge. You know, mm -hmm. you want to see how far you can uh, push everything. Mm -hmm. And um, as an artist, I just went there just to find it. And then you make changes. You know, 30 years ago, uh, there's a lot of things I don't do now that I did 30 years ago. And there's some things I still do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then there's Diddy, another figure who finds himself entangled in these suspicions. Diddy and Prince had very different approaches to the music industry. While Prince fought tooth and nail to maintain artistic control, Diddy cozied up to the corporate machine. After Prince's death, Diddy expressed his admiration, but to many, including Williams, this felt more like opportunism than genuine grief. Diddy's ties to the very system Prince despised don't sit well with those who think there's more to this story. But this isn't just about timing or shady industry figures. Prince's final days raise a lot of red flags. The man was known for being meticulous about his health. This wasn't someone who would accidentally overdose. He was reportedly suffering from exhaustion and had cancelled a series of shows, but nothing suggested he was on the brink of a fatal drug mistake. The counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl that caused his death seem oddly convenient. In a world where so many other artists, from Michael Jackson to Whitney Houston, died under suspicious circumstances, it's almost as if there's a pattern, one that points to something more sinister. Williams has never shied away from calling out powerful figures, and his comments about Prince's death are no different. 
he has suggested that the same forces that benefited from controlling other artists may have wanted to rid themselves of a major problem. Prince was more than just a musician. He was a symbol of resistance against the industry's exploitation of artists. That kind of influence doesn't go unnoticed, and as Williams points out, it's the kind of influence that makes powerful people nervous. If you think this is just conspiracy talk, consider how often these stories come up when an artist takes a stand. Prince wasn't the first artist to challenge the music industry, and he won't be the last, but how many of these artists end up dead before their time? It raises uncomfortable questions about the price of independence in a world where money and control are the real currency. Prince's death is still officially listed as an overdose, and there's been no definitive proof of foul play. But for those paying attention, the signs are all there. The timing, the conflicts, and the sudden end to a battle Prince had been winning. Williams might not have all the answers, but he's asking the right questions. As long as people continue to question the circumstances surrounding Prince's death, the mystery and suspicion will linger. Because when an artist like Prince goes down, it's rarely as simple as it seems. Prince's fight wasn't just about music, it was about freedom, about the right to control your own destiny. He wanted to show other artists that they didn't have to be slaves to the industry, that they could carve out their own paths and succeed on their own terms. And that's why even now, years after his death, his legacy still resonates. He stood up to the people in power, refused to be controlled, and paid the ultimate price for it. The fight over Prince's legacy continues, and his story serves as a stark reminder of the dark side of the music industry. It's a world built on exploitation, on taking advantage of artists who just want to create. And as long as the people in power are allowed to continue running the show, it's hard to see how anything will ever change. But Prince showed us that it's possible to fight back, to refuse to play by their rules. And maybe, just maybe, that's enough to inspire the next generation to keep pushing for something better. Was Prince right all along? Did Jay-Z and others thrive by playing the very game Prince fought so hard to escape? Drop your thoughts, hit like, and don't forget to subscribe.